Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning. Um, <clears throat> It's a little bit early, um, but I just want to start before uh, we get our first speaker on stage by introducing a background to this lecture series. So the first lecture of this year's conference is uh, a Posner lecture. Now the Posner lectures are named for Ed Posner, who uh, uh, organized the first NIPS conference in 1989 and also formed the NIPS Foundation. He was tragically killed in 1993 in a bicycle accident. So historically, NIPS aimed to invite speakers who were peripheral to the field to inform and, dare I say it, entertain attendees about related areas. This worked effectively to maintain the diversity of interests of the community, a diversity that we are rightly proud of. This is a tradition that continues with our invited speakers at this year's edition. Now, the Posner Lectures were begun in 2009 and have included such luminaries as Jeff Hinton, Terry Sajnowski, Michael Jordan, and Bernard Shulkopf. They were formed in recognition of the community's desire to also hear from its leading thinkers. It is a great honor to be chosen, although we are lucky that in the field we have many people who are worthy of such an honor. This year, the first Posner lecture will be given by Zubin Garamani. Now, Zubin completed his PhD in 1995 under the supervision of Michael Jordan. He completed postdoctoral position with Jeff Hinton at, at Toronto before moving with Jeff to UCL to found the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit in 1998. In 2006, he was appointed to a professorship at the University of Cambridge where he founded the Machine Learning Group in the Engineering Department. Zubin's work has been recognized in a myriad of ways. Perhaps most importantly, when earlier this year, Zubin was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society a highly significant honor, particularly for an American. <laughs> Rather than attempting to summarize all his achievements in machine learning, I'll give you a selection by reading from his certificate of election. Zubin Garamani is a world leader in the field of machine learning, significantly advancing the state of art in algorithms that can learn from data. He is known in particular for fundamental contributions to probabilistic modeling and Bayesian non-parametric approaches to machine learning systems and to the development of approximate variational inference algorithms for scalable learning. He is one of the pioneers of semi-supervised learning methods, active learning algorithms, and sparse Gaussian processes. His development of novel infinite dimensional non-parametric models, such as the infinite latent feature model, has been highly inferential. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Zubin Garamani. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my friend Samara Weiss, uh, my mentors over the years, uh, Arvind Joshi, Jeff Hinton, Mike Jordan, Daniel Wolpert, and David Mackay, and to my many brilliant students and postdocs. I'm honored to be giving this Nips Posner lecture. Uh, Nips is my home conference, it's my community. You're 3,000 of my friends out there. and. Um, uh, I've attended NIPS every year since 1992, except for one year that I didn't get a visa. Um, and maybe my greatest contribution to NIPS was uh, back before we had corporate parties, um, I used to organize the infamous uh, Toronto Gatsby condo party, which some of you may remember, for about 10 years. Um, but anyway, NIPS has obviously grown a lot since 1992 when I first attended. So what was NIPS like in 1992? What did we know back then? And what have we learned since? Well, in 1992, neural networks were all the rage. I'd just done my undergraduate thesis on recurrent neural nets for parsing natural language. There were NIPS papers. Uh, this is a table of contents from 1992, the first page of the table of contents. You'll see there were NIPS papers on Things like, uh, you know, uh, regularization methods, adaptive learning rates, combinations of neural networks and reinforcement learning. Um, that year, actually, at NIPS, uh, Radford Neal published this remarkably uh, 
modern paper showing how to do Bayesian inference in neural networks using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is something you could imagine, this paper you could imagine it at this NIPS now. Um, that same year, David Mackay was developing Laplace approximations for um, neural networks. But already in 1992, the tide was starting to turn against neural networks. People were dissatisfied um, at getting stuck in local optima, difficulties um, determining architectures, numerous rules of thumb needed to train them effectively. Around 1992-93, support vector machines were being um, developed and uh, often outperforming neural nets. They're mathematically very elegant and they ushered in a great deal of interest into convex optimization. Um, about a year later, Radford Neal again showed that neural nets with one hidden layer uh, converged to a Gaussian process, uh, that is a Bayesian kind of kernel machine, in the limit of infinitely many hidden units. Um, so why work with, you know, messy finite neural nets when we can do exact Bayesian inference in infinite ones, um, was the thinking at the time. Also in the early 1990s, we were uh, introducing ideas such as the EM algorithm, graphical models, variational approximations, and so on to the NIPS community, drawing links between neural nets and probabilistic models. And this brings me um, to the main theme of my talk, which is uh, machine learning as uh, probabilistic modeling. Okay, so, well, what do I mean by probabilistic modeling? What do I mean by model? So here is sort of what I mean. Um, a model describes data that one could observe from a system. That's what a model is in my view. If it can't describe possible data, then it's hard to know whether it's a good model or a bad model. If we use the mathematics of probability theory to represent all the forms of uncertainty um, that we have in all aspects of our model and all the noise, then the good news is that we can still use probability theory in the form of inverse probability, what's known as Bayes' rule, um, and that allows us to do inference about unknown quantities, adapt our models, make predictions, and learn from data. So it's actually rather straightforward. You're all familiar with Bayes' rule. Um, you may be familiar with this image um, of Thomas Bayes. It's a long story, but it's actually not Thomas Bayes, but this is the best image we have, so we use it anyway. Um, some poor chap um, who's not Thomas Bayes. Um, anyway, uh, you're all familiar with uh, Bayes' rule, written as a way of inverting distributions over x's and y's. Um, I like to think of it more um, in words like this. So what Bayes' rule allows us to do is it allows us to do reasoning about hypotheses given data. So before observing the data, we have a distribution over um, possible hypotheses that represents our uncertainty about what might be a good hypothesis for the data. The hypothesis could be any kind of model, model parameters, et cetera. Now, each hypothesis is, as I said, a model, so we can make predictions about data, so we can evaluate the likelihood, the probability of the data under the hypothesis. That's the second term here. And then Bayes' rule tells us how to combine these to do learning, to figure out a posterior distribution over hypotheses given the data. That's all learning is. Um, it helps us do inference about hypotheses from data, um, and learning and prediction can be seen as forms of inference. And the beauty of this whole framework, in a slide that may be familiar if you've heard me speak before, because I always use this slide, it's a very powerful idea in my mind. The beauty of the framework is that everything follows from two simple rules of probability theory, the sum rule and the product rule. The sum rule says that the probability of x can be written as a sum or integral over some other variable y of the joint probability of x and y, the product rule says that the joint probability can be factored into the marginal probability of x times the probability of y given x. Now this isn't just a boring rule about probabilities. If we now replace x's and y's for the kinds of things we care about in machine learning, d for data, theta for parameters of a model, and m for, say, the structure of a model, then we get a simple rule that tells us how to do learning from data.
we start with um, some uh, prior over the parameters of the model that represents our uncertainty about sensible parameter values before observing the data. We have our familiar likelihood term, which many of you are used to maximizing, but we're not going to maximize anything here. We're just going to follow the sum and product rule. Um, we combine this prior and the likelihood, and we get the posterior over parameters given data. And that's learning. Um, now, uh, if we want to do prediction, let's say there's some unknown quantity, maybe it's something having to do with test data or missing data, um, let's call it X, then again, Bayes' rule, well, it's just a corollary of the sum rule and product rule. Prediction is also just a corollary of the sum rule and product rule. Um, what the prediction rule says is what you should do is average the predictions of all of the um, different possible parameter settings weighted by the posterior probabilities that you computed when you did learning. That just follows from the sum rule and the product rule. And now if we want to do model comparison, um, we just apply the same thing at the level of different models, M. So, um, so it's a very simple framework and it's very widely applicable. Now let me focus a little bit on model comparison um, here's a familiar form of model comparison. Imagine we have, um, you know, these eight data points and we're trying to model the relationship between some output Y and some input X. Um, and we could fit different polynomials to it. So the blue lines show you um, zeroth, that is the constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, etc., up to seventh order polynomials with maximum likelihood fits to the data. And clearly here you can see one of the great, you know, um, problems in machine learning, which is we don't want to underfit, which is we don't want to miss out on structure that may be in the data, and we don't want to overfit. We don't want to fit a model that makes ridiculous predictions. So we want to avoid underfitting and overfitting, and model comparison is a very central concept in machine learning. I've shown it to you for polynomials, but let me show you lots of other examples of learning model structure and model comparison. Questions like, how many clusters should there be in the data? What should be the intrinsic dimensionality of a dimensionality reduction method when applied to the data? Um, if you're doing feature or variable selection, is this input relevant to predicting that output? Um, if you're fitting a dynamical system, what should be the order of the dynamical system? How many states should you have in your hidden Markov model? How many uh, layers or units should you have in your neural net? Um, what should be the structure of a graphical model that you learn from data? These are all examples of questions uh, about learning model structure. They're all analogous to that question that I asked with polynomials. And the beauty of the Bayesian framework is the questions may all be different, but the basic answer is just apply the sum rule and the product rule. Um, so to do model comparison, we get something from those rules which uh, we've called, um, people have called Bayesian Occam's razor. That is, if we want to compare model classes, M and M prime, maybe different polynomials or different numbers of clusters, whatever it is, then you simply compute the posterior probability of the model given the data that's just Bayes' rule. And this term in red is a really interesting term. This is the marginal likelihood, um, sometimes called the integrated likelihood or the model evidence. It's the familiar likelihood that we are all used to maximizing, but we're not going to maximize it. We're going to integrate the likelihood with respect to the prior because that's what the sum and the product rule tell us to do. They don't tell us to do maximization. So what is this marginal likelihood and why does it capture Occam's razor, this preference for simplicity? Well, here are several ways we can interpret the marginal likelihood. We can just read out what this equation says in words. It's the probability of the data under the model averaging over all possible parameter values, not maximizing. It's the probability that randomly selected parameters from the prior would have generated uh, data D. So again, you know, a model that's overly complicated will be penalized. If you like information theory, log base 2 of 1 over the marginal likelihood is a number of bits of surprise at observing data D under model M. So we should prefer a model for which the data is less surprising. 
And so um, if we consider this uh, abstract diagram, where on this axis what we have is, say, all data sets of some size n, then different models of different complexity place different distributions over possible data sets. A simple model may be characterized by concentrating its probability mass on what we could call simple data sets, something like this green curve. A more complex model um, still has unit probability masses. These are probability distributions that have to integrate to one, right? So it can spread its bets over many more possible data sets but by doing so, it can't model simple data sets as well as a simple model under this marginal likelihood criterion. So then if we observe a particular data set D, what happens is that model classes that are too simple like the green ones are unlikely to generate that particular data set, so they're penalized that way. Model classes that are too complex can generate many possible data sets, so again, they're unlikely to generate that particular data set at random. And so that's how Bayesian Occam's razor works. And if we just um, look at that essentially uh, applied to this polynomials example that we had um, a minute ago, um, again, here we have the same examples before. The blue curves are the maximum likelihood curves. The green curves are samples from the posterior distribution of polynomials given the data, um, where I've just chosen a fairly harmless Gaussian prior over the parameters and inverse gamma prior over the noise variance. And the interesting curve is this thing. This is the, um, a plot of the marginal likelihood as a function of the model complexity, the order of the polynomial. And we, what you can see is that the marginal likelihood very sensibly says, well, given this data, it could be a constant function. It could be quadratic. Maybe it could be linear or cubic. But um, you know the marginal likelihood for fourth order to higher is very small on this plot. It's there, but it decreases exponentially. And um, that is because basically those models are too complicated for this particular data. So you see Bayesian Occam's razor at work, um, you know, rejecting models that are either too simple or too complex. And this concept can, of course, be applied to all of those problems that I talked about before throughout machine learning. And we've done a lot of that over many, many years. Now, the, uh, although in the polynomials case, it's straightforward to um, you know, compute the evidence analytically, um, for a lot of those interesting complicated models, we reach uh, the point where we need to worry about computation. So uh, in general, for Bayesian inference, we have to compute things like the posterior distribution of our parameters and the marginal likelihoods that I've been talking about. And these involve computing integrals over parameter space. And computing integrals is a bit more expensive than doing optimization. But the good news is that we have a very, very well-developed series of approximations for computing integrals. Going all the way back to Laplace and probably earlier, we have Laplace approximations, the Bayesian information criterion, which only requires you to do optimization. We have variational approximations, which turn integration problems into optimization problems again, but optimization over the space of distributions. Algorithms like EP, MCMC, sequential Monte Carlo, exact sampling, annealed important sampling, many, many, many methods. So all that's required to apply this framework is to familiarize oneself with um, tools from this uh, set of approximation methods. OK, so that concludes the sort of um, the tutorial part of my talk. And now I want to come to a question that I think is very high on my mind. And that is, of course, we can do a lot of machine learning without the probabilistic framework. There are many, many things we can do in machine learning that seem not to require us to use probabilities or to think in this Bayesian setting. So when do we actually really need probabilities? And I would argue that there are actually a lot of interesting problems for which the probabilistic approach is essential. So many aspects of learning and intelligence, intelligence depend crucially on the careful probabilistic representation of uncertainty.
I'm not saying everything in machine learning has to be done this way. Clearly, we can make great advances without having to do this. But for certain problems, like forecasting, it just doesn't make sense not to have a probabilistic representation of your uncertainty. For decision making, when you have to consider the consequences of your actions into the future, it really seems to make sense to have to represent uncertainty and probabilities. When you're learning from limited, noisy, and missing data, probabilities come in very handy. When you're learning complex, personalized models, models in which you, know, you may have lots of uh, customers or patients, and for, you might have a lot of data, but for each one, you might have a very small amount, then it, it does seem to help to think about your uncertainty. Data compression, I'll talk about this, is fundamentally based on the representation of uncertainty. And finally, if we're trying to automate scientific modeling, discovery, and experiment design, then uncertainty plays a central role. So these are the things I'm going to focus on. I'm going to talk about some of the current and future directions in probabilistic machine learning, the things that I'm really excited about myself and things that we've been working on. So this is a fairly long list, but I'm going to go through them all quite quickly, just to give you a flavor for lots of different problems that um, are interesting, I think. The first one I'm going to talk about is Bayesian nonparametrics. And Bayesian nonparametrics addresses a particular issue with probabilistic modeling, which is that probabilistic modeling isn't, isn't a, an answer to everything. You know, it, it depends on the quality of your model. And we need flexible and realistic probabilistic models to be able to deal with complicated realistic problems. So the Bayesian nonparametric approach to building flexible and realistic probabilistic models is to define infinite dimensional probabilistic models using tools from stochastic processes. And I'll try to explain that in a little bit more detail. And the picture is sort of a picture of a Gaussian process, which I'm going to talk about in more detail. There are lots of examples of this. Gaussian processes, Dirichlet processes, infinite hidden Markov models, Chinese restaurant processes, Indian buffet processes, etc. And the way we can think of these examples is by organizing them into uh, a sort of table where we can think of different applications of Bayesian nonparametrics. So let me just summarize the sort of key idea in Bayesian nonparametrics. It's a simple framework for modeling complex data. I'm saying it's a simple framework because it just follows from the sum rule and the product rule. So the framework is simple, but the models we're going to use are going to be um, rich, complex models, these infinite dimensional models, these models with infinitely many parameters. And clearly, we can't optimize infinitely many parameters, and that's why it's useful to do Bayesian inference over those infinitely many parameters. Now, the nice property that Bayesian nonparametric models have is that their predictive complexity grows with the amount of data. So as I get more data, the models themselves are going to become more rich and complex, do better predictions. And the examples are, you know, if you take simple parametric models like polynomial regression, then you can consider instead using something like a Gaussian process as an example of a way of doing non-parametric function approximation. Or instead of using logistic regression, you could use Gaussian process classifiers. Instead of mixture models, you could use Dirichlet process mixtures. Instead of HMMs, you could use infinite HMMs, et cetera. And let me focus a little bit on Gaussian processes in particular. But before I do that, I'm just going to give, throughout my talk, I'm going to give a few pointers to things that are going on at NIPS that, that are relevant to this. And there are actually two workshops, one on Friday and one on Saturday, um, which will be talking about Bayesian nonparametrics. So let me focus on Gaussian processes. Um, consider the problem of nonlinear regression. You want to learn some function f with some uncertainty or error bars from some data here shown as these points in magenta. These are pa pairs of x's and y's, very much like this example of um, uh, polynomials that uh, you know, I showed you before. So instead of thinking about models in terms of a finite set of parameters, what Gaussian processes allow you to do is to define a distribution over functions. Let's call it p of f which can be used for Bayesian regression. Loosely speaking, you're just applying Bayes' rule over the space of functions, although these functions are these uncountably infinitely dimensional objects. Now, what makes any of this um, at all uh, 
uh, feasible is that uh, Gaussian process is defined by the fact that any finite subset of points, call them x1 through xn, subsets of the domain, input domain x, at those finite set of points, the marginal distribution of the function values, which is now an n-dimensional vector, um, has, it, it has a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So Gaussian process is an infinite dimensional version of a multivariate Gaussian distribution, but the good news is if we're going to do inference with Gaussian processes, all we have to do is um, operations on these n-dimensional Gaussian vectors. So we can do all of this in sensible finite amounts of uh, computation time and memory. And Gaussian processes can be used anywhere where you have a need for an unknown function for regression, obviously, classification, ranking, dimensionality reduction, et cetera. Um, now, it's interesting to relate Gaussian processes to other models, and I love creating these cube figures, which give you relationships between models. And this particular cube figure is starting with uh, this corner being linear regression. And what we're going to do to linear regression is three different operations. The uh, magenta operation is turning a regression model into a classification model. So linear regression becomes logistic regression when you do that, which should really be called logistic classification. The blue arrows turn a, um, a classical model where you usually do point estimation into a Bayesian model where you integrate over the parameters. So you get Bayesian linear regression here. And then the orange arrows are kernelizing things. So you can take linear regression, map it, map your inputs into some feature space, which may be infinite dimensional, and then you get kernel regression. Those are the orange arrows. Now, if we apply um, orange followed by magenta, maybe magenta followed by orange, what we get is kernel classification, which is where support vector machines live. They are um, kernel, uh, classification linear models. If we apply um, orange followed by blue or the other way around, we get Gaussian process regression, which I've just defined. And then if we do um, each of these three operations in any order, uh, we get Gaussian process classification from linear regression. So all these models are very nicely related to each other, and it's very useful to understand how they're related. Here's another interesting relation, which I've alluded to before. Um, if we consider a neural network, so here is a neural network mapping from x's, some inputs to some outputs y, and through some layers of hidden units, and usually the parameters of the neural network, we call them weights, but we could just say, use the symbol theta for the weights of the neural network. Then instead of doing optimization of the parameters of the neural net, you can just do Bayesian inference. It's very straightforward. You define a prior, which may correspond roughly to what you would have used for regularization. And then you try to approximate the posterior over the parameters given the observed data. And prediction becomes averaging over these different parameter values. Now, what Radford Neal showed, uh, which I mentioned before, was that a neural network with one hidden layer and infinitely many hidden units in the limit of this thing becoming infinitely wide, if you put Gaussian priors on the hidden to output weights, um, then that converges to a Gaussian process. Now, in his 1994 paper, actually, I went and looked at it again. He has a whole section where he, he even tries to analyze what happens for infinitely deep networks, which was quite interesting. Um, so that's the relationship between Gaussian processes and neural networks. Of course, uh, we're talking about one hidden layer neural networks with infinitely wide um, layers, and the properties of um, multiple hidden layer networks with finite way, um, width are somewhat different than these um, particular ones that converge to Gaussian processes. But it's very useful to see what the actual distribution over functions captured by the neural network is. Now, um, there's a lot of recent work that, that brings these two fields together, the Gaussian process field and the neural network field, um, looking at models like the deep Gaussian process by Damiano and Neil Lawrence, who introduced me just a few minutes ago. Uh, there's some lovely work by Tang Bui and colleagues um, uh, looking at inference in deep GPs. 
uh, at the workshop on approximate inference. There's some very nice work on deep kernel learning by Andrew Wilson and colleagues. And we've done some work interpreting um, dropout in neural networks as a form of Bayesian inference with Yara and Gal. So these fields are coming back together and we are reanalyzing and understanding the relationships very nicely. The second topic I want to talk about is um, probabilistic programming. And this is an area that I'm, you know, incredibly excited about. And let me try to convey why I'm excited about this area. So the problem that probabilistic programming is trying to address is that probabilistic model development and derivation of inference algorithms is difficult, it's time consuming, it's error prone, okay? So this stuff is usually done by hand, but just like nowadays you don't convert from high level programming languages to machine level code by hand, we have compilers for doing that, probabilistic programming offers a beautiful and elegant way of automating the process of deriving inference algorithms. So here's how it works. The solution is that you have a probabilistic programming language which expresses probabilistic models as computer programs that generate data. These are simulators in the kind of same sense that I talked about models being things that generate data. You just write them in some high-level general programming language, maybe a Turing complete programming language that is able to express, um, you know, universally express probabilistic models that can express any computable probability distribution. It's possible to do that. So you write down your model in that very general format. This is much more general than, say, a graphical model. Then, the amazing thing is that we can actually develop universal inference engines for these languages that do inference over the hidden states of your computer program, those hidden variables in your computer program, those calls to the random number generator, given some observed data. So you write your simulator, and then you say, well, I don't want to think about simulated data. I want to model this actual observed data. Can you please reason about what the hidden variables in my simulator should have been to match this observed data? And the universal inference engine will do that. And these things already exist, which is probably surprising. They're not incredibly efficient, but they're getting much, much more efficient every year to the point that we will be able to hopefully replace um, hand derivation of inference methods. Now, there are many languages, and there's a long history to probabilistic programming, things like Bugs, Stan, Blog, Church, Venture, Anglican, Probabilistic C, you know, whatever your flavor is, there is a language developed for um, doing probabilistic programming, and we've developed a few of them recently ourselves. And there are also many inference algorithms in this engine, in this universal inference engine, the back end, that have been developed. Many of them based on MCMC ideas, particle filtering, particle cascade, MCMC methods for big data, et cetera. Now, um, here's just like a a quick picture of what a probabilistic program might look like for something like a hidden Markov model. This is a graphical model for a hidden Markov model. This is a probabilistic program for a hidden Markov model. It's fairly short. I'm not going to go into it in any detail. It's written in our, in our version of Julia, probabilistic programming language. Um, and the basic thing is that you just write down your model um, and you say, okay, predict the states, you told it what the data is, and predict the states, and then it goes and does inference. And now if you want to modify your model, let's say you want to go from a hidden Markov model to a Bayesian hidden Markov model, or to a switching hidden Markov model, or something like that, you just have to modify a few lines of your code, and the inference will automatically then work on that. Now, I really think this could revolutionize scientific modeling, machine learning, and AI once we are able to abstract ourselves from this. And I hope that many of you were able to attend Frank Wood's tutorial um, yesterday on probabilistic programming. And if not, then there is also a workshop um, on Saturday on black box learning and inference, which is about probabilistic programming. Um, the third topic I wanted to talk about is Bayesian optimization, another thing I'm incredibly excited about. Um, the basic idea of Bayesian optimization is the following. It's trying to solve an incredibly general problem, which is global optimization of functions that are expensive to evaluate. So imagine this is the problem they're trying to solve. You have some function f of x. You want to find the, the optimum, x star. 
And I'm calling these black box functions because all I'm going to assume is that the only way you can access f is you give it an x and then out comes f of x. You might be able to also access derivatives and so on, but we're not going to necessarily assume that you can do that. This can all be extended to handle derivatives. And now the key idea is that these functions are expensive to evaluate. These are maybe experiments in the real world or something like that, okay? And so we want to be able to optimize these functions as quickly in as few function evaluations as possible. Um, so instead of trying lots of random things or whatever, what we need to do is act rationally. So the solution that Bayesian optimization gives you is to treat the problem of optimization as sequential decision making under uncertainty. And the uncertainty is about what is the actual function value um, at points I haven't evaluated yet. So here in this picture, let's say I've evaluated the function at these three points. I know what the function value is at those three points. Maybe it's a bit noisy, but I don't know where it is in other places. So I model it. I model my uncertainty about the function before I've actually evaluated it. And then I have an acquisition function that tells me what is the optimal greedy next decision to make to learn where the optimum of this function is. So that might be here, then I evaluate here, and then my acquisition function changes and I need to evaluate somewhere else. Now this has a tremendous number of applications uh, from you know, robotics, getting the gait of a robot, um, to drug design, to learning neural network hyperparameters, many, many things where you have to do expensive experiments. And here's just an example of some of the work we've been doing with many colleagues listed here on um, a, a, a Bayesian optimization criterion called predictive entropy search. And the basic thing that you want is um, curves that go down quickly in the sense of like, you know, here's some error metric, lower is better, and you want to come down as quickly as possible with as few function evaluations as possible. Um, and you can do this with constraints as well, optimization with constraints, which is something that we've recently been working on. Um, and if you're interested in more, then there is a workshop on Bayesian optimization <clears throat> on Saturday. Okay, so the fourth topic I want to briefly talk about is data compression. And you're all familiar with data compression. You know, if you ever do gzip or zip or, you know, if you ever use a CD or the internet, you know, you're dealing with data compression all the time. Now, um, the problem data compression tries to solve, obviously, is that we often produce more data than we can store or transmit, and we need good methods for compressing data. Now, the solution is quite interesting. It turns out, and I'm sure many of you already know this, but it turns out that uh, by Shannon's source coding theorem, all compression algorithms are implicitly based on probabilistic models, okay? So every compression method out there is basically a probabilistic model. Now, developing better sequential adaptive non-parametric models of data then allows us to predict the data better, making it on average cheaper to store or transmit. So by improving probabilistic modeling, we can implicitly improve compression. And we can do that actually very explicitly in certain cases. And we've been doing some work, this is with Christian Steinrichen and David Mackay, developing um, a new compression method called PPMDP which is based on a probabilistic model that learns and predicts symbol occurrences in a sequence. And in fact, it, the underlying concepts are actually hierarchical Bayesian non-parametric models. And some of you may fami be familiar with, for example, the sequence memoizer, which is also in this same line of thinking. And it works on arbitrary files, but delivers basically cutting edge performance at compression for human generated text. Human generated text is, you know, things like text or source code or music and things like that, okay? These models are also useful for smart text entry, anomaly detection, sequence synthesis. So they're not just compression. It's not just for compression that we need models of sequences. And here is some, you know, example of, uh, of how you evaluate different compression methods. Um, Here's some results. These are a whole bunch of different um, data sets. These are all different kinds of data sets. And then these are different compression algorithms on the columns. 
gzip is the first one here, purple is bad. These are bits per symbol. Okay, so gzip is relatively speaking a pretty bad compression algorithm compared to what's really actually at the state of the art. Um, our methods, PPM, DP, are these last three columns, and we're basically, um, for a single compression algorithm, not one that's based on a humongous ensemble of different methods, but for a single compression algorithm, we're basically better than all the other methods, except for, interestingly, a few of these data sets where LZIP is better. And the reason, we think, is that these data sets are actually computer generated. They're not human generated. So their statistical structure is actually very different. And you would imagine that maybe some combination of PPMDP and LZIP would produce incredibly good compression rates. Um, okay, the next topic I want to talk about, and I've only got two more, is um, the automatic statistician. By the way, these things are all, in my mind at least, related. There's, there's many common threads to all of this, and I don't really have time to describe all the common tools. But I mentioned that, for example, compression is based on Bayesian nonparametrics, and Bayesian optimization is often based on Gaussian processes and so on. Okay, here's the automatic statistician. This is a project I'm, I'm really excited about. It's been uh, you know, it, on my mind for about 10 years to do, and only in the last two or three years we've really managed to make some serious progress. And the basic problem this is trying to solve is that data are ubiquitous, as we all know. There's great value from understanding data, but there are not enough people out there, like you guys, to analyze all the data. There are not enough machine learning researchers, statisticians, and data scientists out there. So if we think about that, well, what's the natural solution to that? Well, let's automate some aspects of data analysis. We're not going to be able to automate everything, but we can automate certain things. So we're going to develop a system, and we have been developing a system that automates model discovery from data. Processing the data, searching over models, discovering a good model, explaining what's been discovered to the user. And the, the last point is actually really important. We don't just want a black box that's doing prediction. We want something that will also be able to do interpretation. Okay, so um, here are some ingredients of the automatic statistician. There's an open-ended language of models from which uh, lots of models can be generated. There's a search procedure for finding good models. There's a principal method for evaluating models, and that sort of, um, the basis of that is the marginal likelihood that I've been describing, although we can also use um, cross-validation error, for example, for that. There's a procedure to automatically explain models from data. And the goal is to go from sort of raw data to these reports, which I'll talk about. And uh, for the example that I'm going to talk about, um, the language of models that we have is going to be a language composed of words. These atoms are going to be um, kernels of Gaussian processes. So these are just five base kernels that produce different kinds of functions, and we can combine them into, you know, by doing addition or multiplication of kernels into much more complicated kernels. Um, and with all that, then we can do search over good models for data. So this is model search for um, time series. Here's a famous data set called the Mauna Loa Keeling Curve using climate science. Here's the observed data, and this is the model fit and the extrapolations. Um, it starts, it evaluates the base kernels, and then it picks good ones and expands on that and keeps going, using the marginal likelihood as a guide and knowing when to stop when the marginal likelihood starts going down. And this is the sort of final model that it comes up with. And then it generates um, uh, a, an entirely automatic analysis with some textual description of the form of the model. So this is the executive summary of what it's found. Um, and actually what it ends up producing are these 10 to 15 page reports which we cheekily formatted like NIPS papers, okay? So these are automatically generated reports from the automatic statistician. And you can look, um, you can look at them uh, if you want um, by going to the web page. Lots of examples of these reports. Now, the automatic statistician doesn't just uh, produce interpretable reports. By doing the systematic model search, we're actually ending up with models that have very good predictive performance, really state-of-the-art predictive performance at extrapolation. This is sort of uh, an example, average over 13 data sets, and root mean squared error standardized here. So, you know, three times better than linear regression is sort of down here. Okay. 
And another thing that we've been thinking about is that we want our automatic statistician to be self-critical. Okay, we want it to do good statistical modeling, which includes model criticism, you know, asking the question, does the data match the assumptions of the model? And we've developed methods based on posterior predictive checks, dependence tests, and residual tests to implement that self-criticality in our automatic statistician. And we're um, also doing some work on you know, more systematic non-parametric approaches to model criticism. This was uh, in a paper presented by um, James Lloyd last night here. So the final thing I want to talk about is uh, a key ingredient, actually, of the automatic statistician, but it's a separate concept, actually, in some ways. And this is the rational allocation of computational resources, again, a place where uncertainty plays a, an important role. The problem here is that many problems in machine learning and AI require evaluating a large number of models um, on potentially large data sets. So that's potentially very, very expensive to do. A rational agent needs to consider the trade-off between statistical and computational efficiency. And the solution to that that we have is to treat the allocation of computational resources as a problem in sequential decision making under uncertainty. So again, you, you test out different models. Here's how it actually works. We, we um, extended a beautiful paper called the Freestyle Bayesian Optimization Method by Sersky, Snook, and Adams to build predictive models of how things will perform if they run longer. So based on their performance running them for a short amount of time, we try to get them to run longer uh, and form ensembles in the model combination framework and then we allocate our computational resources based on what's actually more or less promising. And I have a video I could show, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip it in the interest of time. Okay. Now, um, a very nice thing is that when you allocate computational resources reasonably, you can do great things. And this, I don't want to take any credit because this was a bunch of people in my group, I wasn't really involved, um, put together uh, a system that actually won first place at the most recent round of the AutoML classification challenge to, quote, design machine learning methods capable of performing all model selection and parameter tuning without any human intervention. And so they're doing machine learning under strict time, memory, and disk space constraints. And they're doing that by running a bunch of machine learning methods um, and then having this sort of Bayesian reasoning system on top of it, figuring out how to allocate the computational resources to individual things. And I'd love to show you the video, but I'm going to um, skip that so we have time for questions. So um, uh, if you're interested in this, there's actually a NIPS workshop um, on challenges and competitions in machine learning well, the, where they'll talk about the AutoML competition on Saturday. So to conclude, um, probabilistic modeling offers a very powerful framework for building systems that reason about uncertainty and learn from data. And it goes beyond the sort of traditional pattern recognition problems to think about all sorts of other things. And I be briefly reviewed a bunch of things that I'm personally really excited about at the frontiers of research in this field. A lot of what I talked about actually was covered in a review paper I wrote earlier this year in Nature called Probabilistic Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence. So if you like this stuff, have a look at that paper, which talks about it in a little bit more detail. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators, and I want to just do two more things. One of them is to announce um, this very exciting new venture which is uh, the Alan Turing Institute. We have a booth outside if you're interested. It's the UK's new National Institute for Data Science. It's a um, joint venture between a bunch of universities, Cambridge, Edinburgh, Oxford, UCL, and Warwick. And it's uh, located in this fantastic location in central London. And the Alan Turing Institute is um, looking for on the order of 10 or 15 Alan Turing Fellows, and these are really great jobs, three to five years, independent research in any aspect of data science, including machine learning. The deadline to apply is very soon, so I just, just look Alan Turing Fellowships if you're interested in. And one more thing, um, I'm, uh, this is the first public announcement, and I'm delighted to talk about my involvement in a New York-based startup called Geometric Intelligence. Uh, we've got some great technology. Uh, that can learn from much less data and we're hiring. So, all right, thank you.
questions? Start with this gentleman at the front. So uh, Zubin, that was a fabulous lecture, um, as always. Uh, so there's a, a revolution that is occurring in um, the business world. Uh, data are being digitized at a prodigious rate. And uh, a recent report by um, the, 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 uh, the, there was uh, McKinsey, which is a consulting company, predicted that in the next 10 years, 40% of all middle class jobs will be eliminated, or at least 40% uh, of the tasks of people who are shuffling papers will be all digitized and then susceptible to machine learning techniques. Now, what I've learned from you is that not only will these middle class jobs be taken over, but uh, your automated statistician will take over a lot of machine learning jobs. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, on the one hand, I am actually worried about where this is all going. Um, and I think there's some serious issues, um, you know, that are coming with the progress of science. But, you know, let's be clear, the automatic statistician is not, and I've had statisticians complain to me, is not going to take over the job of statisticians. Think of them as very powerful tools that will make the people out there more efficient, and it, they'll also make a lot of those people who can't afford to hire a machine learning researcher or a statistician have some nice online, uh, you know, uh, uh, server where they can upload their data and then it'll, it'll do some analysis for them for free, basically. So, you know, it should make everybody more productive. So if there are other questions, do they want to quickly come to the mic? No, you must have summarized it all. Okay. Oh, question Oh, there. question here. Just a quick question about the Julia code you flashed on the screen. Is, is that, does that work, or is that just a, 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 a <laughs> scheme? Um, okay. It, it works. Um, and as of last week, it works even better. Okay, so it worked to the extent that it, it does, um, in, behind the hood, we can implement any model we want, and then it will do um, a form of uh, particle MCMC inference on our probabilistic programs. But the problem was that for some technical reasons, namely coroutine cloning, it wasn't actually very efficient to do this in Julia. So my student you know, heroically went and, and rewrote bits of Julia to be able to get that to be efficient as of a week ago. So I think it's actually reasonably efficient now. But there are many choices for probabilistic programming languages out there. And I don't, I'm not trying to push any one of them. I'm just trying to promote this whole area, which I think is really exciting. Joelle? Hi, thanks. Zubin, you've made some really interesting comments about the importance of having representation of uncertainty for many tasks. Can you comment on how important it is to have a proper probabilistic representation of uncertainty compared to having more predictive representations of uncertainty? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. There are many ways of representing uncertainty. You can look at, for example, you know, intervals as representations of uncertainty. Um, confidence bounds, which are not sort of, um, you know, Bayesian predictive probabilities and so on. Um, I'm generally in favor of representing uncertainty. Now, I, I think that I particularly favor the Bayesian representations because they're actually um, quite modular in the sense that we can combine, uh, we can pipe together many components that have representations of uncertainty and get a coherent representation over overall uncertainty, something that is more difficult to do with confidence intervals or with, um, uh, or with other kinds of intervals. So I think there are some nice advantages, but this is not the only representation of uncertainty is true. Okay. One last quick question. Yeah. So uh, thank, Zubin, thank you very much for a clear presentation of the fundamental to uh, cutting edge. So I'm very much impressed with the automatic data, data scientist idea. So for example, uh, I've been working on automatic building of a neuron model based on some underlying knowledge of neuroscience. So uh, for the, the automatic data scientist to make a model, uh, how much do you think you need, uh, we need uh, to implement the knowledge about physics or biology for the mechanism underlying data. 
That's a, that's a great question. And um, essentially, what we're targeting with the automatic statistician is um, essentially agnostic tools. So basically, you upload a table of data, and it goes and churns away and tries to uh, come up with a reasonable model of the data and then explain it in words to you. Um, clearly, for a lot of scientific applications, you want to put in as much uh, prior knowledge as you have. And for those, you can go either two ways. You can build it yourself, or you can, if there are repeated forms of data analysis that you need to do of a particular kind, you could build a special form of automatic statistician that has sensible knowledge about that particular domain that is good at producing analyses of a particular kind of data set. Like examples that I've looked at are not in neuroscience, but for example, for gene expression microarray data, you could build a special system for that. Okay, I'm going to stop there, I think. Yeah, great. Yeah, so if we can just thank Zubin again for a really great start to the conference. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Mm -hmm.